What, what I claim is that all the varieties of free will that are worth wanting, we can have in a deterministic world. That the, I can define varieties of free will that are incompatible with determinism, but they're pointless. They, they, don't, they don't give you anything that matters. They, don't give you, they, they aren't needed for moral responsibility. They aren't needed to give your life meaning. They're, they are completely gratuitous. Uh, they're sort of bizarre metaphysical conceits. They don't pull their weight. You don't need them. Who cares? Their views on all of these things, judges' views, teachers' views, educators' views, one assumes they must be predicated on some model of the mind or some model of human nature that these people who are making decisions have instantiated and that, that they, are, they, they are using as their... Right. But these, ver these, these vary. There, isn't, there aren't... <laughs> no, that's right. I mean, there are some people who believe that, you know, we should understand humans and everything else in society simply as machines and that they are predetermined machines that are playing out you know, the causal determination of the universe, uh, and therefore the concept of responsibility is an empty one because um, it is, uh, every action can be explained by every causal factor that came before it, um, and to ascribe responsibility to some concept of agency or self or person, um, it is, is an artificial construct that we've created. That's a model that somebody could take, which would then color, of course, their views about all of these things, and they might say, the key to understanding everything is to understand the causes. If we can understand all of the causes, then we have the complete answer, um, and we can descriptively explain why things are the way they are. The idea of normative decision-making is an empty one in that kind of universe, and obviously I'm, I'm operating from a slightly different perspective, which is um, that we can understand that there are natural causes that precede actions doesn't answer for us um, whether we assign values to those actions or not. Those are normative decisions that I think we have the capability to make. Um, so even if we come to the conclusion that none of us are free, we will continue to operate as if we are, and I think that that is a valuable thing to understand and to operate within that construct and constraint. I don't believe there's such a thing as free will in the sense of a, uh, a ghost in the machine, uh, a spirit or soul that somehow reads the, the TV screen of the senses and pushes buttons and pulls levers of behavior. Uh, there's no sense that we can make uh, of that. Uh, I, I think we are, our behavior is the product of physical processes in the brain. On the other hand, when you have a brain that consists of 100 billion neurons connected by 100 trillion synapses, there is a vast amount of complexity that means that human choices will not be predictable in any simple way from the stimuli that have uh, impinged on it beforehand. Uh, the first problem is that we live in a world of cause and effect, and either our wills are determined by a long chain of prior causes, and we're not responsible for them, or they're determined by some random influences, and we're not responsible for them. And no matter how you, you turn this dial between the iron law of determinism and randomness, this notion of free will doesn't make any more sense. There's, there's, no, there's no way of combining chance and determinism that makes sense of free will. And even if you believe that each of us harbors an immortal soul, this, this problem of responsibility remains. I cannot take credit for the fact that I don't have the soul of a psychopath. I didn't make my soul. If I had truly been in this person's posi position, if I had the same genes and the same brain, the same life experience, or the same soul, I would have done exactly as he did and for the same reasons. So, so the role of luck in our lives appears decisive. Two things really. One is that when you look at the brain and the brain's functions, there's nowhere where it all comes together that you can say, well, this is the part of the brain that is the control center, really. It's, it's, it's all over the shop. It's all over the shop. And different functions are distributed in different ways. And the only thing that brings it together is, well, two things. One is the body. So we're more or less the same body from one day to the next. So when you look in the mirror, it's the same as it was last time we looked in the mirror, more or less. Um, and I think it's the story. And those are two, the two aspects of the self that I think we've begun to understand a bit better. 
in terms of how the brain constructs these ideas. Is, is there any point in asking where the stories come from or why we would choose some stories over others? Well, you have to make sense, in order to survive in the world and in society, you have to make sense of who you are and who you are in relation to other people. And although I would argue and other people would argue there is no inner essence that is the person, we nevertheless have that construct in mind. So we have to have that. In other words, I'd say I don't believe in the ego. Um, I'm more of a, a so-called bundle theorist. Uh, I think bundle theory is true. Explain ha bundle theory. Um, there is no inner, in, inner essence. We are built from language and memory that we, from those materials, we construct a story that is consistent from one day to the next that helps us negotiate the social world. And that's what we are. That's, that's the bundle. But there is no inner essence. You can strip away strands of the bundle and that happens in neurological disease. So people lose language ability or memory ability or perceptual skills. But the bundle rolls on until it stops. Um, but there's nothing in the middle of it. That's the, I mean, what I was about to say was that, although I think that's true, I can't really get my head around it. And I don't believe anybody really can. And I think that there's a real kind of paradox there, which is, you know, the paradox of what it means to be a person. The world is, we are fragile things in a, in a, in a difficult world and a, and a random world, a capricious world. And that was a shock. So yes. Um, but um, if we don't accept that we're fragile, then um, we run into other kinds of problems. And, um, you know, it's part of becoming insightful about what it means to be a person is to realize that we're fragile. Namely, whatever we do was, is predetermined by the state of mind that we had yesterday. Corrupted by some noise that came from cosmic radiation and other, but still we, yeah, whatever we do, okay, is predetermined. How far do you want to take that back? Do you want to take it back to... Uh, uh, it becomes, you live in a completely deterministic, spinozistic yes. universe or what? I believe in Newtonian mechanics. Which means that uh, <clears throat> I believe that the, uh, the uncertainty principles that we heard from Heisenberg in quantum mechanics applies to subatomic processes, but not to macroscopic processes. And neural firing is more or less a macroscopic process. And even if we go to quantum mechanical level, it doesn't yet, uh, it only moves the determinism from from uh, observable to probability state. So it doesn't make much of a difference. Our actions are predetermined. And if you want to go to quantum mechanics, then the probability of our, of our actions are predetermined. It doesn't, it doesn't absolve us of responsibility, of our slavery to predeterminism. Given that, and I believe in that, okay? I strongly believe that uh, we are a deterministic machine. Given that, it's a puzzling phenomena that we all talk as if we have an option. And now the question comes, going to the robot world, should we equip robots with the same illusion? Are we going to benefit from that? Are they going to benefit? If we equip them with that language, vocabulary of free will. Now part of what I suggested at least with regard to the folk psychological story is that we tend to think of our decisions as created, created within a sort of causal vacuum. And so we need to ask the question, can we have a conception of voluntary choice where we recognize that causality operates? So I'm going to give you a little bit of history and then I'm going to go into some detail on what contemporary psychology has taught us about these things. David Hume in the 18th century, I think, gave the classic response to Descartes, who really did think that if, unless you had uncaused choice, you were essentially uh, a puppet. And Hume made the observation, uh, simple, clear, as many of his observations were, 
that, in fact, of course, decisions must be caused by background, antecedent, desires, character traits, moods, temperaments, all of these things must be part of the causal background. But the kind of deeper point, in a way, that he made that really surprised people was that uncaused actions or uncaused choices would actually be, in a certain sense, random and kind of nuts. So suppose that, for example, all of a sudden, with no causal antecedents, I decide to sing Strawberry Fields. And you say, well, why did you do that? I mean, you don't have a good voice. You don't typically do that. Uh, nobody wanted to hear it. Uh, I mean, I said, you know, I just decided. You'd be worried, <laughs> right? You would be worried. And, and, and I think it's a point that many quantum physicists who think that the solution to the problem of free will is going to be found in quantum mechanics, have totally failed to understand. We can talk more about that, uh, too. But it is, I think, worth pondering that the kind of free will worth wanting, as Dan Dennett would say, is not the free will where, in a causal vacuum, I suddenly decide, I think I'll take off my shoe and throw it at Roger. <laughs> or sing strawberry fields or what have you. Doesn't make sense. It must come out of ourselves, our character, our hormonal milieu, our homeostatic measurements, and so forth. Now, first of all, there is, I think, the presumption that the important factors that go into decision making are all in the conscious domain. And of course, mo as most of us know very well, that isn't true. That many factors that are critically important for a decision uh, are in the non-conscious domain. We are, we are in fact this uh, hodgepodge of non-conscious and conscious processes with some part of our uh, consciousness trying to ride herd over this yes. mess of, <laughs> uh, of yes. non-conscious processes and uh, which of course needs to be very uh, clearly spelled out because you 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 have of course the the, the people that uh, listen to something like what we're saying and you say oh my god they, they're saying that you have no control over oh, right. oneself and over one's behavior and no willpower of any kind and of course that's false because we do have a measure of control but it is not true that we have full control. No. And it is not true that when uh, we are executing an action, we are necessarily controlling it at that moment, at that consciously. Moment. Right now, for instance, I am really on the warpath about free will because I, there's a veritable chorus of neuroscientists who are saying free will is an illusion. I mean, exactly in those terms, free will is an illusion. And I said, well, let, I just want to calibrate your view. I want to know, is solidity an illusion? Are colors illusory? Are dollars an illusion? Is poetry? An, just tell me what your answer to those is, because I want to know what you're saying when you say that free will is an illusion. Um, that's usually not a good way of resolving the difficulty between the manifest and the scientific image. Usually a more complicated but more nuanced story is better. It's the problem that I originally discussed years ago when I imagined we come across these people who talk about fatigues, where we talk about being tired and they want to know what fatigues are. And we think, well, that's, that's not a very good ontology, but <laughs> we neither want to be uh, compelled to take fatigue seriously as items, nor, however, do we just want to say, ah, there's no such thing, because in their world, these things loom large. 